This is Patrick Russell. I'm interviewing Dwayne Pinkston for the first time. This interview is taking place at uh, Largo, Florida on April the 24th, 2015. This interview is being conducted by the Making History Project. Uh, why don't we start, Dwayne, with uh, when were you born? Oh, I was born May 30th, 1924. And Next month I'll be 91. Okay. And uh, where were you born? I was born in Shaftsburg, Michigan. Shaft, like a shaft. Cut bird. Well, that was the name of the doctor. So that's, he, he was named after him. All right. Can you describe your hometown? Is it big, small? No, it's little. I don't remember it because the time I got big enough to go to school, I was living in a, outside of Ionia, Michigan, which was a bigger town. Okay. And how big was your family growing up? I had four sisters. Thelma was the oldest, then Nola, two years, then me, Duane, two years, and then Ruth, two years, and Genevieve, about two years. So I had four sisters, and uh, we, we went to school in Ionia. Okay. And how old were you uh, when the war started out? When what? When the war started. Oh, the war, uh, we got bombed Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. Now, I was 17. And, and so uh, you were in high school at that time? Yeah. And um, how did you feel about those events? First of all, nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was, <laughs> but we found out. And then, of course, everybody wanted to join up, you know. And but I didn't want to because I loved to hunt. I loved hunt pheasants and rabbits, and I've been hunting them since I was 12 years old. And so I, I let them draft me, but they still got me while I was 18. But. Uh, but we, uh, <clears throat> and then I always wanted to be a doctor, and they give us this IQ test, intelligence quiz, mm -hmm. and then they suck that over and put you in the branch they thought you were best suited for, and they put me in the medics. I thought, boy, that thing's pretty good. Then I got out to Fort Leonard Wood. There's 500 of us went in the army, and geez, they's all out there. And I thought, yo. Oh, Man, we couldn't all be ready to be doctors, you know. And so, so the 500 of you were all doctors? Oh, well, training medics, together? Medics, not doctors. And, but uh, oh, they, some of them did, some of that. And, and I stayed there and took basic training. And then uh, I signed up for, I passed a test for aviation cadet. And I stayed there for another 17 weeks and they didn't call me. So a fellow came through wanting to get guys to sign up for the paratroops. So you had to volunteer for that. And they didn't. They couldn't draft you in that. And uh, so I said, well, I'm here long enough, so I signed up for that. Three days later, I was on my way to Fort Benning Jump School. And um, that was hot. I remember it was down there in the summertime. We went, I went through jump school and uh, Boy, I'd never been in a plane before. And when I got on the ground that first jump, I laid there for a minute, I thought, oh my God, I done it. And, and then I began to sweat, my fatigue got all wet. But anyway, I got through jump school and, and then they kept me there for about eight months. And finally, they come through and they said they needed uh, 25 medics for, well, I, it was the invasion of Europe was coming up, European continent, and uh, so I volunteered and uh, I went to, uh, well, there's two of us good buddies, Carmen Russo, Italian boy from Philly. He and I were pretty good buddies. And, and he was a surgical technician and I was a medical technician. And so Captain Wolf, he said, or Major Wolf, he said, uh, I suppose you want to be with together. And I said, be nice, okay. He sent you to Walter Reed Hospital for six weeks and then I come back. I was a surgical technicians. <laughs> and anyway, we went overseas, 25 of us, and 
56 engineers. We got to, uh, uh, we landed in Ireland, went to Cookstown for about a week, and then we went to England, Camp Corn, outside of Loughborough in Leicester. You remember what year this was? Pardon? This was 1944? Yep, yep. See, I was a replacement. I, I wasn't one of the original. See, the original ones had gone over in Africa. They jumped in Sicily, then went back, and then they jumped in Italy. Then they come from Italy to Ireland. That's where I met them, and I was a replacement. And uh, I went down to C Company. Captain Stenhouse told me they needed a medic. I went down there and to the cap company headquarters, and I saluted the Captain Stephanie told him who I was, and I said, Captain Stenhouse says you need a medic. He said, you're it? And I said, I thought you got something better. <laughs> he laughed. He said, Johnny, that was Lieutenant Johnson. He's even a nice guy. Well, he said, you're the one that needs the medic. Yeah, so he took me out and introduced me to uh, Sergeant Zeitner, Staff Sergeant Zeitner, 2nd Platoon, so I was with them. So I stayed with them, and whenever they were on the rifle range or any kind of firing range, you know, mortars, hand grenades, machine gun. I had to be there in case of an accident. And then after we went through Nomadu, we come back and we had German equipment too. And of course, being a, a hunter and a country boy, I go, I want to see how them Ger those German bazookas and things work. And so Johnny and I go over to one side of the range and we'd be using that using them to see how they, and they come in handy. We captured about 500 of them in the bulge. And some of the guys come back and we showed them how to fire them. Because okay. I fired our um, bazookas, but these here were a lot more powerful. And, and the uh, Panzer But they Faust? only fired once. And, uh, but then, uh, yeah, Captain Stefanich was C Company captain, and I know he, uh, he told Captain Stenhouse, he said, Pinky's one of my best bazooka men. <laughs> he says, I'd, I'd like to get him for the company. And he said, Captain Stenhouse said, no, we got too much invested in him. And then, uh, and, and I was good at getting stuff to eat. You know, I knew around the farm things. I knew how I, I was in charge of our meat program at home. We butcher hogs, and I, we had a meat house. And you'd, cut them up and hang the meat up in there. And after Thanksgiving, everything froze. <laughs> but, but anyway, I went into, want me to talk about Normandy? Well, tell me about, were you a medical technician or did you end up the surgical technician? Well, uh, yeah, I was supposed to be a surgical technician. It wasn't much difference. It's just a name. And, uh, but see, when you went in combat, it was only you. I was up there and those guys, I had about 45, 50 guys there and, and, and take care of them and another bunch in the first and second platoon. Anybody hurt, I was, that was my job, take care of them. And gee, I, I thought, man, some of those wounds and things, you know. And, but I just did a lot of praying and I started right in working on them. And, uh, I got real, everybody liked me on C Company. We got along good because I could shoot a gun, I could shoot mortars, and, and, and I was a good medic. I, they thought I was a lot better than I was. They used <laughs> to say, I, they, they come up there after Normandy, they got the combat infantryman's badge came out and paid them $10 a month more. And the medics didn't get anything, so C Company took up money come up there to pay for us three medics in C Company. And he said, no, nah, I, I appreciate it. He said, but I think we're going to get something. Well, you tell Pinky we were here. They always call me Pinky. Um, Is that when it, your nickname started? No, it started and went on a little playing ball. Okay. I had a Pinky Higgins and some of them guys are good baseball players, Tigers okay. in uh, Detroit. And, and uh, so 
So he was telling me, he said, they, C Company thinks a lot of you. And I said, you know what? C Company thinks I'm a lot better than I am, too. He <laughs> said, <laughs> you're doing all right. I said, I didn't have near enough training for kind of job I got thrown into. Well, <laughs> tell me about that training. What kind of training did you receive well, to become we, a medic? We knew how, we knew first they taught us to stop the bleeding, check the airways, treat for shock, which I didn't have much time for. Sometimes I just had time to stop the bleeding and, and make sure that it's breathing and then go to the next one. Then you had these tags you had to fill out, an EM, EMT tag, what, no, EM, emergency medical tag. And then they had the ones for the KIA tag, killed in action. And you're supposed to fill that out, put down in Germany or any, you know, you ever try to spell the names of some of those towns over there? <laughs> I couldn't even pronounce them, that lone fellow. That was Stan Ostello and God, I sure get a kick out of pinkies <laughs> writing on them. And he told me one day, he said, see, I got out, I quit school in the 10th grade to help work on the farm and stuff, because things were hard. And, uh, and he, said, he said to me, Pinky, how come you, I give you these big, long diagnoses and you write them right out perfect and spell them? And he said, I see you only went to 10th grade. I said, yeah, I did. I need more education. So I did. I got it in there. But I mean, he was, uh, but he, I finally told him. I found uh, a little book, had all their subscriptions and things in there and what, what they wrote down, you know. And uh, they all, pretty, when you got into them, you knew they were pretty much like you learned anything the with his teeth, with stoneitis or something, you know. And uh, I told him, I said, that's where I got it. Well, you did all right, even with a book, he said. <laughs> Some of them diagnoses, I don't know how to write all, every time. But uh, yeah, I did. And How long was your medic training while you were in basic? Well, I was in there. I took basic training and had medical training there. Then I had 17 weeks advanced basic training waiting to go to the Air Corps, and they, and I, they didn't call me. And, and then I went to Fort Benning. I, they kept me right in the, in the uh, medics. I went out on the rifle range. We had to qualify, and I started right in. I, first four shots, I got three bullseyes, and then that captain, he wanted me, and then Major Wolf, he wouldn't let me go. I didn't want to go anyway. I thought, well, I'm training, so. So. Uh, was your training as a medic different than what the other guys were doing for basic training? Oh, yeah. What was the Except difference? Except for we had to qualify with a gun. I don't know why, but we did. What was the difference? Huh? Oh, well, we had classes we went to, and more like, more like going to school. And... Uh, and then we'd have tests, you know. And then we'd go out on bivouac, and uh, guys make believe they shot or, well, in fact, sometimes you did have some cases where guys got hurt, you know, and, and uh, a lot of us there, so they'd take care of them. I was watching what they was doing. But then I finally went overseas, and I thought, and I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for all the blood and stuff, you know, and, but boy, I, I saved quite a few. I tell you, there in Normandy, one day we walked right into a, uh, we was ambushed. And I mean, we walked right into it. And uh, the 88s was up there about a mile and they'd blossom out like lightning and bang, they'd hit right side you. And uh, I was taking care of guys left and right and a guy named Pennington good friend of mine. He's from outside Memphis, Tennessee. And he used to sharpen my trench knife and my, we got a switchblade up here in a little zipper. And he always kept them sharp for me. We were good buddies. And he was only about 10, 12 feet from me. And a big shell come bang, throw me right through the air, knocked the wind out of me. And I heard him hollering for medics. And I got up and I could still operate. So away I went. And one of them was Wendell Angel. He got 
about that wide, about that long, right out of the top of his head, skull, and his brains were pushing out. They're packed in there pretty tight, but they're probably swelling some too. And uh, so I took and put, we had sulfa drugs. They weren't near as good as penicillin and stuff, but I put the sulfa drugs on it, keep it from getting infected, and I put a recurrent of the head bandage back and forth, back and forth, and round and round. I got done, <coughs> I thought, oh God, he ain't gonna get 50 yards you know, that white head. So then I took my helmet off and to cook my beanie off and put it on him. He could walk. He didn't know what was going on or nothing. And I had another guy like that. Then I had Wally Crawford, great big old rancher out west. Yeah, great big arms. He got three of them right to the bone, right to the bone on the through it. And, um, and he went to France with us in 1979 said, you did a good job. They kept me in that amputation ward for two weeks. And they said, good, you, good thing you had a guy right there. He said, or you'd have lost your arm. But, and then uh, our uh, radio man, Bernard Thomas, he was from Oregon. And uh, he, he was getting the A company on our right, telling them, you know, get around behind us, you know. And then he said, man, they're murdering us. And I, he said, you hear me? And they said, we hear you, 5 old jive. We were 505, you know, they like jiving or boogieing or something. And I could see them over there about three quarters of a mile and they was running. Well, when they got behind the artillery and got that shut off, well, then there's a different story. Then our guys all came and got the Germans retreating and, and uh, they didn't show them any mercy there, but, and, and I was, I was down there, Sergeant Zeitner and I was creeping to a big dredge. We were trying to get in that, you know, because we was in grass about that high, <laughs> pasture field, and we we were target, you know. And we got about 15, 20 feet from it, and everything was making so much noise, I just happened to look. I seen a hand grenade come out of that dredge. German, because they see it rolled over there and exploded. And I grabbed a hold of Sergeant Zeitner, and I shook my head no, you know, and I grabbed his hand grenade and took it off and throwed it in there. And just before I throwed that, one came out and hit his helmet and bounced over there. But theirs were little concussion grenades, and they weren't like ours. Ours had all them, they call them pineapples, you know, they break and they'd all fly just like bullets. And, and so when that happened, we took off running back, and Jungle Jim was our BAR man. And when we run by him, then we hit the ground, and Sergeant Leitner had a Tommy gun, and he cut loose with that, and then, oh, John, I don't know where they got the name, but that's what they called him when I met him, Jungle Jim, and he run like mad back, because we didn't want to run too long, two guys run together, a little too much for the guys up there. Anyway, uh, a guy got wounded, Kunze was his name, he laying on his stomach, his buttocks are shot off, and I could see the inside of his kneecap from back, and he lay on his stomach. And I thought, gee, he should be dead, all this. I said, but he was conscious. I said, you in pain? No, everything's pretty numb. Sometimes it hurts a little. I said, I'm gonna give you a shot of morphine. He said, don't leave me. I said, no, I ain't gonna leave you. I said, you got a stateside wound, you're going home. He said, yeah. I'm going home, and he died. So then I heard a whistle, and I looked through the hedgerow, and there was a German lieutenant trying to get the men up to, to chase us out of there, you know. And I, I took off running, because the guys had pulled back. And I see, I just had enough wind to make it to a one that went to crashways. I was going up this one on this side, and they was all out there. And I dove over that one right on Jungle Jim, B.A.R. man. Oh, God, Pinky said, I put near shot yet. Yeah, I thought you were a German. I said, no, but they're out there. Anyway, about uh, about 38 years later, I'm down to Fort Benning. My wife and I, and we stand there waiting for the buses to take us to the officer's mess. That's where we had our banquet dinner. And I looked and I said, well, Wendell, how are you doing? Wendell Angel. He, oh. Pinky, he said, I got wounded bad. He said, I, uh, 
I got a steel plate in my head. He said, I, I'm, I'm lucky to be alive. And he I said, well, how are you doing anyway? As long as I don't bend over too long, that I'm doing pretty good. And then I told him about him coming up there and how I took my beanie off, put on him. I said, that was like making a supreme sacrifice. <laughs> and, oh, God, they had to get his wife over there. Here's the guy that saved my life. You know, I I'm had sure you have a lot of those reunion. stories. <clears throat> And uh, okay, after that we well, when we get back to England. Well, uh, yeah, okay, I'll tell you the southern. There's another one I told you. We were uh, we let, cutting the peninsula off. Normandy is a peninsula that sticks out in the English Channel, and we stopped at noon that day, and we didn't fight no more until. The next morning they said you got about 45 minutes and we're moving out. So I was getting my aid kits all around. I got ready and I looked and the guys were way over on the road. So I thought, well, I'll take a shortcut across the field. And I was looking down because I had two good buddies got killed with boob personal mines. You trip a little wire and bound up about that high and go off. And sometimes it killed. T.J. Crane, he was a staff sergeant, went overseas with me. And he and, and uh, Donald P. McLeod, he was a staff sergeant, and they only could send one so that would car would see who would take a bus so they could go over and get in combat. Well, he took the bus. Uh, he got killed in Normandy. He got, a guy got wounded, and they hollered for a medic, and he tripped and blowed his stomach out. And Motor Hack got killed up in England. He became the regimental photographer. He didn't, that was another story down in there about when we was fighting. I told that one to Patrick O'Donnell. He wrote it in that book, Beyond Valor. Okay. Uh huh. And <clears throat> but I was going to tell you, I started across there, see, and, and I was looking down. All of a sudden, I looked up. I was looking right at two Germans and a machine gun. And I just stood there looking, because they didn't move. I kept looking, and well, I thought, that, that one's dead. Looks like it. And I looked, and the other one, I kept watching him. He moved a little bit, but he's on his back like he was wounded. So I kind of got around where I could see the Red Cross on my arm, and I got in there, sure enough. So he was wounded right inside the size, and uh, I started working on him, give me water, because he's thirsty, lost the blood. And uh, <clears throat> he could speak English, got learned in high school. And uh, he scared to death of me. He said, they told us you paratroopers didn't take enemies, that you shot us. <clears throat> I said, they tell you a lot of things. And, uh, and we got getting along pretty good. He see what I was doing, you know. And, and he even showed me a picture of his girlfriend. <laughs> She's in Berlin. <laughs> and... Uh, Pretty quick, I see he was scared again, and I looked, and Sergeant Hines from uh, C Company that I was with, his platoon, he, he came out there and he had that shotgun, or his rifle up, because he'd seen there was green uniform. Because he said, I told him guys over on the road, Pinky's been on his knees over there for 10 minutes, something's wrong. I'm going over. And so he said, and then I got close and I seen them German uniforms, so I figured I better get ready. And that scared him. And then I waved him in and told him what was going on. And uh, he looked rough. He was rough, too, but I found out later he was a school teacher in Kansas. He's a nice guy. And uh, we, uh, what are you going to do with him, Pinky? And I said, well, I can't carry him alone the way these wounds are. He said, can you carry him like this? I said, yeah. Okay, get him ready. I'll help you. So we did, and we made it out to the road, and I said, well, hang a right, it's about a half mile where the aid station is, and they're getting ready to move out too. Well, we only took about three steps, and out come a jeep and wheeled up there, they saw us. I get back to England after Normandy, and Captain Stenhouse was telling me about that. He said, you know, when you and uh, Sergeant Hines was carrying that German out of there, I said, yeah. He said, I look up the road and I said, hey, here comes a couple of paratroopers carrying a wounded guy. Better get a jeep up there. And then he got the glasses out and he said, hell, that's Pinky and 
line sergeant and they're carrying a German. He said, I wish I'd have had a camera. If I could have got a picture of that, that would have showed the world the difference between us and the Nazis. And I said, yeah. And they'll, so then they want us to get the town. They didn't want us in the tents because when you get back, that's when you miss them because you've all been living six to a tent, you know. And there's only two in my tent. <laughs> I wasn't going to stay in there. And so. What does that mean that you're missing? You're talking about? Uh, killed and, and wounded. So yeah. people don't like to sleep in their tents after combat. Well, because you're used to six men. And I went in ours and I was the only one there and I wasn't going to stay in there alone because I knew some of them were killed. But anyway. And is that something that most people would do? Yes, it's just when like, they came back. It it's was just kind like of a nobody wants. To, that's right. Then they get back to their empty tents, and they're two or three, or maybe only one, or maybe four. And nobody wants to stay. In. You miss them then. You really miss them. So you've been fighting, and you, they're on the line, and you don't know, you know, or somebody might tell you. But anyway, I got uh, oh, so we went into town. They have them pubs, which is like a tavern. This is in Normandy. Still, no, or? this is in England. In England. Where, where were you After, stationed in England? Uh, right, it was in Camp Corn, Q-U-O-R-N, Camp Corn, and it was outside Loughborough, about three miles, and Loughborough was kind of a mining town, not too big though, and uh, it was near, Leicester was a bigger town. I went into Leicester and watched Glenn Miller and he'd been bland play, <laughs> you know, before he got killed. Before you get too far, um, tell me, um, you didn't tell me what unit you were in yet. A so C Company, 1st Battalion, 505, Regimental okay. Combat Team, they call this it. This is the 82nd Airborne. Yep, 82nd Airborne. Right. Well, I was going to tell you, we went in this town, and we had a glass of brew. I wasn't much of a drinker, but I would drink a glass or something, you know. And uh, Sergeant Hines... He said to Staff Sergeant Zeitner, he said, there's some English girls over there in their blue, light blue uniforms, Air Corps, like we had women in ours too. And, oh, Clyde Hines, he said, boy, he says that little blonde shore is a cute little thing. Want to meet her, Zeke said. Well, Zeitner, we called him Zeke, unless the officers were around. And anyway, he, uh, oh, you don't know her. Oh, I do too. You do not. Oh, I do. And there's always riding one. Uh, Zeitner was from uh, Nebraska on a ranch. I got a story to tell you about him, too. But anyway, uh, we, way he went, and here he come with that little gal, little blonde-haired gal. Had her right by the arm. He said, I got a foreman here. Or, <laughs> not a foreman. I got a sergeant here who wants to meet you. He said he thought you was the cutest little thing there was. So he introduced him, and Eventually, they got married. Really? Yeah. They come over. The, in fact, Junie and I saw her last time. was in a reunion at Boise, Idaho. And Sergeant Zeitner was there. And he had a... I never saw her, but his nieces, uh, they were nice girls. They said she was a wonderful woman. She was really nice, inside and out. She, and well, she'd passed on. He took care of her about two years, I guess, and, and, and uh, so he, I talked to him, I said, hey, I see uh, Hilda, yeah, Clyde Hines, is, Clyde died, he had emphysema bad, and he said, yeah, he says, I think she's looking for a man. I said, well, if she can find the right guy, it'd be a lot better, she's quite young yet, you know. Yeah, but I think she's looking at me. <laughs> I said, well, Sarge, I looked after you all during the war, but I can't help you here. <laughs> I said, this is, a, you're on your own. Oh, that was funny, but, yeah. And, oh, and then they called me up to C Company headquarters before I got back from Normandy. They said, Pinky, do you know anything about Pennington? I thought, oh, God, I, I think he got hit by 88. They said, yeah, we thought so. We found an arm. They thought it was his. So They never found him? 
That was about all there was left when them 88s of them big artillery guns, you know. But, and he was like 10 feet away from you. Yeah, he went, that's one of the, where I went flying through the air, too. Concussion. When was that? Hmm. When was that? I'd say within the first probably seven to ten days sometime in there. It's hard to keep track of. And you remember yeah. the the closest town? St. Mary Lee's. Mm -hmm. But uh yeah, and uh, so that was too bad. So I like to tell the other one last about Heinz, because I, I said that that one turned out good. <laughs> but I told that one about Sergeant Heinz to the seniors, German seniors. There's girls, and mostly girls, but there's a few boys, and uh, they couldn't speak English. And I said, hey, come get me to talk to them. I said, you know I don't speak German. They said, yeah, well, we got an interpreter for you. A little girl from London, she wasn't any bigger than they were, or about the same age. And man, she could, just, hey, that's good something. She asked me right off the bat. Mm -hmm. What made you volunteer for the Airborne? Well, I tell you, times were hard, and you got $50 a month more for jump pay. And so I. That so was I, the main reason? Yeah. Money. Okay. What, uh, what about the, the coolness of it? Oh. It was like the new, the new unit. It was new, and the jump boots they shined them up good. You know, you kept them shining, and uh, they told us how great we were. How was the training for airborne compared to your basic training? It was rough. Tell me about it. They, Tell me some of the things that okay, you had to do. Okay, they take you on. Uh, sometimes you go on a twenty-five mile march. And, what to, and then, then it was rougher on us medics. They were the infantry, because old Major Wolf, he, they come out with that movie, uh, The Iron Major. I think he thought that about him. But anyway, he, he, them guys pass out or couldn't walk, get a hold of them, help them, help them. Well, gee, you had all you do yourself, you know. We had to cover that 25 mile, too. And they had a lot of things, push ups. They come along, they see you. Have your hands in your hips or something. Hey, soldier, 25 push up. You have to do them. They're always giving you push ups. You couldn't get out of it because even if you're doing something right, they'd give me five for that. You know, but uh, they was, it's hard on you physically. But it turned out pretty good. The last run I went on for, I went overseas, I run 11 miles without stopping. And guys run further than that. But I mean, that's what I, we'd double time, and then we'd sprint. And you got so you could rest when you're double time. Was there different <laughs> training for you as a medic while in the airborne training? Or did you train just the same Not as that. everybody else? Not that. But then after we got in combat, when we come back, we had the other things to do, get more of our drugs and thing, uh, things. And, uh, and the captain talked to us sometime, give us a test or a little, see if we see. See if we're still able to think right. <laughs> what kind of combat training did you have to do? Were you a, were you riflemen or what did you have to work with? Yeah, the guys that were me. I didn't. I didn't have a gun, but okay. I. Uh, yeah, they were riflemen, Tommy gun, machine guns, uh, mortars, like you have in a regular. But you were company. you were able to use them. You just didn't have one. Yeah, but that's just because the guys so like me. They had me come down and try it. I'd want to see how they operated. And they so it was all, more out of curiosity for yeah. you than anything. Yeah, you'd go take. We them get out. out there on the range, you know, and they, hey, Binky, come here. I want to shoot a machine gun. Now I'd been watching them, so it didn't take long for me to. I thought, hey, what the heck? And you already <laughs> were a hunter. Yeah. What was your favorite uh, favorite weapon to fire? Where in the army? Mm -hmm. I liked the M1, except it was heavy. 
but that thing would lay them bullets out of there quite a ways, and they'd shoot them straight. And if you got hit by one, you <laughs> the biggest oh, buffoon or whatever you want to call it I saw in the army and come to firing was that forty-five pistol. I never seen anybody that could hit anything with it, <laughs> and I had one. Somebody, no, I didn't carry it, but he gave me one. I was shooting at a pail full of sand out there. I kept going closer and closer, and I thought, well, they shoot a big bullet, you know. Well, Lieutenant Hop come around, hey, Pinky, let me show you how to do that. He said, you many can't shoot. Pow, pow, pow. He didn't hit, him. He didn't hit it either. <laughs> Damn, he says, this ain't very good. But uh, the other ones were accurate. I did have a uh, Beretta. Italian Beretta when I uh, jumped in Normandy and that was because they claimed that we had a right to protect our wounded from the enemy <laughs> when I seen all, all that machine big guns and things I thought I ain't going to do much of this <laughs> so I didn't take one after that I did get a chicken with it one day though <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have to fire your weapon uh, as a medic? Well, I, I only had it in, no, I just, no. and I think I might have shot a pig. <laughs> <laughs> and how was the relationship between the medics and the rest of the soldiers? How Good. did that play out? I tell you, nobody, when you went to town, nobody wanted to take a swing at you or something because them guys were right there. Nobody touched their medic after they found out what we did, you know. Hey, we were kind of raised up a little higher. Because they, they knew that you had their back. So yeah. And they, uh, they, you were you know, their guardian they, angel. Yeah, they was a, well, they used to call us their silent heroes. Okay. Uh, and, uh, Were you yourself ever injured? Three times. How'd that happen? Well, in Normandy, <clears throat> we was digging in. I had a bank there. We were digging in down below, and then I started to dig back under the bank. So anything hit, they wouldn't, you know, I'd be, you'd be back. So I dug there for, oh, probably an hour, and finally, I got tired and started to say, and I said, hey, come on out of there, I'll do some digging now. And he said, I had my coffee. So I was making a cup of coffee on a little Coleman stove. And uh, they told us, if you ever hear a shell that sounds funny or anything coming through the air, hit the ground. Because they're always coming up with something, you know, trying to invent something. And they, so I was just sitting down on my combat jacket. I heard that thing, blub, 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 boy, and I dove. And even though I was diving, it felt something like it pushed me just like that, you know. Got hit right in the back. Right? Other scars back there, but So anyway, what was that, a, a mortar or? It was a aerial burst from an artillery gun. They had shells that would explode about 15, 12 to 15 feet above the ground. They were a bugger. That's the first time. And so there's a forward artillery observer. He had his Jeep there and he said, take my Jeep and take him back to the beach. So they took me back and they got, uh, they worked on me and they finally, I think it hit and bounced out. I said, I don't think it did. Finally they got a, look like a long rifle, piece of metal. Okay. And uh, this happened so, in Normandy. Yeah. So they how put, soon? Huh? How soon? Oh, probably 10, 12 days. They put a no, oh, maybe a little longer than that because I didn't go back to the company. But they put a hose in there, plastic hose. They wanted somebody to pull it out a quarter of an inch and cut it off every day. Because see, they're going to send me in England. I said, I better not go because I said, we don't have any medics at all now. And uh, so I went back out and then the driver was gone. They said, I was always losing the driver. But the Jeep was there. 
and a truck pulled in. He said, where do you want these? And I said, what do you got? <clears throat> Rice pudding, raisins in them, in little cans of con condensed milk, you know, like they used to have. And I said, hey, put all the, the, uh, the boxes, they didn't box, put all the boxes you can in this Jeep right here. Even this seat here, that driver's not here, I'll take it. And I said, well, three boxes of those little. So they did. And then I took off. I said, put the rest right there on the ground. I took off before they found out. <laughs> and I got back and I stopped the aid station. I told them, Captain Stenhouse here, so you're not going back there. He said, I'm going to have to take care of you. It's better. And I said, I got some rice pudding with raisins and some little cans of condensed milk. We'll take some and I'll send the rest. One of the, a couple of guys there had a Jeep, one of the medics, or they were both medics. And I said, find a Sergeant Zeitner and tell him. I sent these up to him. And so they did. And uh, up in Holland, Captain Stefanich got killed. Well, he got wounded bad uh, in Normandy, out on the bridge, the Lafayette Bridge. <coughs> And Johnny Johnson, our first lieutenant, he ran out there and got him, got him off from there. And so when we come back, well, he was still down in the hospital. So then a couple months later, he come back. Okay, he met a nurse and he was engaged. So Johnny Johnson and Jack Tallarday, they said, I don't think Z, or I don't think uh, Captain Stephanie's ever had a girl. We're going down and check her out. So, so they went down and they come back. She's a nice girl. So they they be a fine couple. And then second day he got killed up in Holland. Hmm. And, uh, when did you jump into Normandy? June the 6th. So I jumped in there. First day. <clears throat> we took off at quarter to 11, June the 5th. And uh, we had little airports. <clears throat> they made themselves a lot of them. And ours was a small, the only the first battalion could take off. And then the second and third battalion, we were at Spanho Airport. And uh, the second and third were at Cottage Moor. That's the names they give them. They. And uh, so we had to take off and then rendezvous over the English Channel with the second and third battalion. Then we took off right down the channel, cut around, and then cut right across Normandy. Then jumped about six miles forward, they went out to the English Channel again. Because we, if they went in and turned around, it wouldn't take them long to figure out. And, <clears throat> and I landed, I think, I think, I know a lot of guys say, we landed at 2.30. Well, I know we landed before that, because we took off at quarter to 11. Hmm. I figured around 1.30 myself. Do you know where you landed? Mm -hmm. We landed right, uh, I think we, I think we landed as close to our drop zone as we could almost. And we got hit just before we jumped and our plane went into a, zoom, the flames are flying. I thought, oh my God. And we were standing up, hooking up, and I was on my back looking right up at the pilots. And he pulled that baby out. And they pushed me back, I was number two man, they pushed me back up to, behind uh, Sergeant Zeitner. And he was a jump master because we had nine plane loads and only eight officers. When we jumped in Holland, I was number two man again. He got too far out and a prop blast caught him. And all of a sudden I see our DZ coming out, I went to pat him and he's gone. And then in the when <clears throat> Alan Langdon wrote the history of the 505. He was in our plane while well, he was our company clerk. He said, I told us one plane was short two people. He said, we short one man. Staff Sergeant Zeitner leaned a little too far out the <laughs> door and the prop blast took him. And we looked up and we had Duane Pinky Pinkston, our medic, who was our jump master. And he let us out of there with all the aplomb of a veteran jump master. When, when you say a prop blast, what does that mean? 
So he was pushed way out from of from the engine. So where did he end <laughs> up? <clears throat> oh, he's on. He got up to us in about twenty minutes. He wasn't far, a couple miles. He got a. He landed on the right side of the river. That was one thing. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah. you landed on 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 D Day itself, and you said you landed near your where you're supposed to be your yeah. zone, yeah. which is unusual because most of other people got scattered. Um, do you know what zone that was? What was it near? I don't know what it was near, but it had that little uh, amber light. Chuck Copping, he was a C Company uh, Pathfinder. He jumped. He had that little. Uh, amber light up there and a little beacon that they could kind of tr hit tr and Do you recall the closest town? I, was, uh, I wasn't far from St. Marigley's. Okay. Because see the second and third ta battalion took St. Marigley's. The first battalion took the Lafayette Bridge because that was that bridge isn't very big, but it... Uh, no, it's pretty it, small. It was a fact that it was the only thing. They had everything flooded, and that's the only thing you get tanks across on. <clears throat> so, tell me what it was like the night before you knew you were going to jump into Normandy. What was everybody thinking about? How did you feel? Hmm. This is the first time you're jumping, right? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't really know. It was more. <laughs> I was more excited when it come north to Holland because I knew what could happen. And I thought after Normandy, you know, there ain't no way I'm going to get out of that again like that. So you were excited for the first jump. Not really excited. I was just nervous, maybe. Okay. But anyway, we did pretty good there, and. Uh, then we come back and got ready for uh, while well, we jumped in the Netherlands. But we we got out the airport two weeks before that. We was going to jump in Belgium, and, uh, and then they, we was out there. Oh man, I wasn't ready for that jump. And we Which was one's that? To, in Belgium, okay. we didn't jump. They called it off. All of a sudden, I heard a guy hollering, and there were a bunch of them had come running. Jump called off. Jump called. Oh God, I felt good. And, uh, but then two weeks later, we jumped in the Netherlands. Jumped about 50 some mile behind the lines there where we were. We had the 101st strung out up through that highway. And see, the 101st and the 82nd, we knew them guys because they had uh, the 82nd was the first airborne division. Okay, uh, Sergeant Marshall or General Marshall and the guys in Washington. and. Probably some of our guys helped too, with the, like Gavin and them. They wanted another division, so they did. So Ridgeway, I think he was. He, I don't know. He probably. Uh, I think he was a colonel yet, but he was in charge of 82nd right then, and he divided it up as equally as he could, men and officers, and told General Lee who was going to have the hundred percent. Take your pick. So he picked, and the rest of them got more men, got the men, build it up. And they went over early. That's why the 82nd had four combat jumps, and the 101st, they had two, same as I did, because they, they went over later. But, uh, well, I was going to tell you about Sergeant Zeitner. He was one, one of the all-time heroes of C Company. And he could speak German, and he could understand German. He could understand it better than he could speak it. But and uh, he was raised on a <coughs> out in Nebraska on a ranch. <coughs> and they had six girls and two boys in the family. And his folks got killed, and I can't remember how, but I think it might have been an automobile accident. And uh, so he and his younger brother. They got with a thrashing crew. Went, ended up way up in uh, Montana in the fall. Uh, Rancher and his wife wanted to adopt him, send him to school, because Zeke was 16, his brother 14. Zeke talked his brother into staying. He went on out the coast. He got with a guy that was raising peppermint oils and stuff like that. And when they that fall, they had six five gallon, six 
yeah, five gallon cans of different oils. They had a 33 Plymouth and they drove clear from Eugene, Oregon, outside of Eugene, to Washington, D.C. And the guy, he got a three state franchise to, they could sell through him. He could sell for all three states, you know. And he did not, neither, Zeke said, but then in 1941 for Christmas, they bought him a new 1941 Ford Club Coupe. The guy was a millionaire. Well, Zeke, he was a, he wasn't one for taking money that, you know, he didn't earn and stuff, but he looked like one of those Marlboro men. He was a real nice guy. And, uh, okay, went in the Army out there, went to Fort Benning, went through jump school, and uh, went overseas. He jumped in Sicily and then Italy. And in Italy, he and Alan Langdon and a couple other guys were walking down the main street in Naples. And they see some tanks over there. They see a young guy coming up through there, had a patch on his arm, you know, like 7th Armored or something like that. And uh, he walked up and he said, you guys are 82nd Airborne, ain't you? They said, yeah. <clears throat> he said, you wouldn't know Herman Zeitner, would you? Zeke said, hell, I'm Herm Zeitner. He said, I'm your brother. He hadn't seen him for 14 years. He's the one he left out in uh, Montana, you know. Really? Yeah. And uh, What are the odds of that? Yeah, how about <laughs> it? And then and, uh, Captain Stephanie's give Zeke a pass to go with his brother for a few days because he hadn't seen him for 14 years. His brother was 28 and, and uh, Sergeant Zeitner was 30. He was 10 years older than I was. And, uh, <laughs> but that was something. You, know, and well, you said he was one of the biggest heroes of C Company. Why? What did he do? Oh, well, he did a lot of things. And he, a lot of times he had C Company himself, our officers who were gone. And so, <clears throat> well, I'll tell you one time, Battle of Bulge. Okay, it was a January 3rd, I think. I think, yeah. And uh, it was uh, foggy and you had a wet snow about, about that deep. The ditches had water in them. <clears throat> and we attacked. And our, our kitchen went up there with us because they didn't jump, but they uh, we went up in trucks. <clears throat> and, and anyway, we took off. And they had everything zeroed in with artillery, the Germans did, because they were going to attack the next day. Holy mackerel, we had to get through that and through their uh, small arm fire and get to the artillery. And we was up, we was moving up this little fire lane, and I was out of, I told Zeke, I said, I got to get some equipment. I said, I'm going to run back to the aid station. And I said, and I'll catch up with you. He said, okay, I'll take her a little slow. And so I run back to the aid station. I see all these men in this ditch with water. You don't know, geez, why don't they get out of there? And I run into the aid station. I said, I got to fill my aid kits. I got to get back up there before dark. Never did get very light that day. And uh, so Captain Steinhouse told Bob mm, Lehman, hey, give him yours. So he stayed, Bob was with the aid station. So he had, just like mine, when he jumped yet. So I just unhooked my two and hooked his up and I took off running. Okay, I caught up, well, I, first I caught up with two guys and I was going with them and I looked up and I said, hey, there's a German up there. No, no, that's our guys. He's just wet and he got his clothes, makes him look dark green, you know, like our combat suits. And I said, well, he's pointing a gun at us and he shot and ding, and that son of a gun. And then he got the, out of the fire lane, we didn't see him. But then, I caught up with uh, Sergeant Zeitner. All of a sudden, a whole bunch of tanks sat there. We come up by. Holy mackerel, we walked over there, and there's a captain, a major there, and we said, boy, we could have used you guys today. And man, we did. the whole division took a shellacking. We lost a lot of men. I had 39 men that morning in my platoon. That night I had 19. And, uh, 
and all of a sudden a sniper shot and that uh, colonel come out there little guy kind of heavy set and he said sergeant was like sergeant go get that sniper zeke looked at him we've been through heck you know i thought you better be careful uh, i kind of touched zeke so he wouldn't say something you know and he went mention me he said what's the matter are you scared he said i'm not any scarier than you are sir and then we took off and we got up in there and guy from b company hey they saw me they said how many men you got in c company i said here's sergeant zeitner he knows he said i got about 36 men well they had 50 some a company they had less than we did and then they did a whole bunch of german bedding down from the night in a big hollow so we went up there and put the machine guns up and hollered them from the surrender and they uh start shooting well that was a bad thing there's a lot more of them than there was us, but we had the, we had probably about nine machine guns or better up there around that. Boy, and then finally they got a flag up there and Sergeant Zeitner got the guys to hold their fire. And then I went down in there and we had a six by six truck. We started loading wounded German. I wasn't too keen about that either. You know, after something happens like that, they're liable to shoot you, you know. They didn't care, you know. Well, you're thinking a little different too. And I got 21 wounded. Lieutenant Miller from B Company was helping me load them. And then the, no driver. All I can drive. And then no, nobody rides shotgun. I said, I don't even have a gun. <laughs> and if I'd have found Sergeant Zeitner, he'd have got me a guy. But I took off. I went right, right straight to regiment. Major McElvoy was there. I said, hey, Major McAvoy, I got 21 wounded Germans for you. Okay, he looked at me and I was wet and cold. Pinky, you get in there, take them clothes off, get some blankets wrapped around you, get something warm in your stomach. You ain't going back up there tonight. Oh, God, that was the best words I ever heard. <laughs> I went in there and uh, they give me some warm coffee and then some scrambled eggs. I don't know where they got them. And... Uh, Anyway, the next morning I had my everything was dry and I had them all on. And they had a driver for me. I was going out. He said, Hey, Pinky, Major Macquarie, you only had 20. I said, Well, I said, The old adrenaline was running pretty high, you know, I could have made a mistake. It was dark. <laughs> so we took off. We got about a mile up the road and something sat on a tree. And there's a one zero one. Tree lane knocked him off. Chuck <laughs> driver said, what do you want to do? And I said, if he made it through last night, let's take him back. So we took him back. I said, here's your other one, Major McAvoy. And he said, uh, I said, well, I was going to tell you about Zeke, but I'm going to tell you. I stopped and see Major McAvoy on the way home from Florida one year. <clears throat> and uh, he took me in his den there and had all them pictures. He wrote a book too, The Way We Were, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> had a picture of me in it. But <clears throat> he said, uh, <clears throat> we talking. He remembered me bringing those Germans in there. Yeah. I said, yeah, I said, we had it pretty rough, didn't we? He said, we did, but we had a rough bunch of guys. And you know, when they come home marching down New York, Fifth Avenue or wherever it was, I, then they got through and then they kind of began milling around a little down there. And a little old lady come down there and looking at them. And there's a lieutenant there, a Lieutenant Myers or something, something. And she said, I just wanted to see what they look like. Why, he said, they're just babies. He said, lady, they're the toughest babies you ever <laughs> saw. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I know, uh, oh, well, we got them back up there. And Zeke says, you know, when I come down out of there, I had about 120 wounded, or I mean uh, prisoners. And he said, B Company, about the same, A Company. And I come, when I come by my mind, I said, hey, Colonel, here's your snipers. And he said, then the uh, major and captain we were talking to, they come out and they said, Zeitner, will you sign this? He said, what is it? We got to get rid of him. We didn't fight today. We never fired a shot. 
he just gets scared and he gets around in a circle in the woods and stays there. Heck, yes, I'll sign it. And he signed it. And then he said, the next morning, when we, when we went out, we had tanks with us. And, and I read it in a book, and I know it had to be those guys because it's telling about the guy leading the attack. He called back and he says, hey, who are these guys running around up here? They say, hey, that's a 505. They're paratroopers. They're around our side. Don't shoot at them. And he says, uh, they're, they, they ain't going to be... He, they said they wouldn't uh, be getting any... Uh, bazookas in your tanks, said, take care of them. And he said, oh, yeah. He was talking to his seniors back there somewhere. Oh, he said, hey, you won't believe this. Two of them just went by me on bicycles. They're leading the attack now. And he talked a little more and he said, oh God, you won't believe this. A horse and a cart and eight paratroopers in it and they just passed me. <laughs> and, and then about 20 minutes later he said, you know what? 35 paratroopers horseback just went by me. He says, they're all out in front. He says, them guys can hunt, can fight with us anytime. Wow. You mentioned uh, when you jumped into Normandy that you had uh, some pathfinders with you. Are they any different than your normal airborne? Well, a pathfinder is just guys that went from your company and they trained them in uh, pathfinder school because they had to put up the, the uh, little amber beacon and... Uh, so they landed first. Huh? They landed first. Yeah, they went in about a half hour ahead of us. And then you followed behind them. Is it true that they went in with mohawks? Some did. Yeah. Some had their face all blackened. Mm -hmm. How did that all start, do you know? Well, first guy to jump, when they're going through jump school down there, when he jumped out, he hollered Geronimo, <laughs> and so that kind of stuck. And that's how it started? Yeah, I think that's how it started. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> You were going to tell me a little bit more about, um, about Zeitner, how he was <clears throat> the hero. What else did he do? Okay, uh, that was one job there. Another one. Uh, second day in Normandy, or getting dark anyway, getting later in the afternoon, and we used it. They had some big gravel pits that we were in, right up from the bridge. We did, you turn and you went down there about a mile or so to the aid station, but just coming right down the hill. And uh, here they come, the Germans, 24 tanks. That's what they said. I didn't count them. I didn't. <laughs> and I know <clears throat> here they come. We had a little guy there with a 57 and a tank gun. <clears throat> the gun crew was all wounded or killed and the sights were knocked off. He sat there and he had big thick glasses and he's a crying. I said, you're going to have help here. Somebody be here in a minute. And I went back over and I, and, uh, then when they said the tanks are coming, I looked and Lieutenant Johnson was over there. And uh, Zeke had the men lined up where, and had two bazooka teams, and they knocked out that little, they knocked out the first tank. A lot of guys took advantage, you know, said they did it, but I, it was Lieutenant Johnson and that little kid knocked out the first tank. With the AT gun? Two bazooka teams got the second and third. Okay. And then what happened? Did the tanks back off? Yeah. Well, what was I going to tell you? Zeke says, I'm going down there. We could hear him down there. The old tanks turning around on the... So we went down there, him and I together. I wouldn't have had to went, but I, <laughs> we were buddies, so we went. We got down there, and we could hear him japping away, talking, you know. Finally, he pinched me on the shoulder, and... We backed up and got out of there. I said, what are they saying? He said, near as I can tell, they said we had tanks coming up at noon and they was gonna, they're getting their crossways as bridge so we can't get across. 
I said, I hope they come. But I didn't see him. I was there three days. But uh, he, and uh, every time they needed a prisoner to interrogate, they sent out two or three squads, or not squads, two or three patrols, and come back. Then they'd call Zeitner. He would always get one. And away he went. And he was the interrogator because he knew German. Not really, but he could understand them some. But they had a one that was an interrogator. We had a guy that was, he just, he left Berlin 39. Hmm. And he was in our outfit. And he was, <laughs> and they, they had those, uh, uh, Colonel Scorsini, he had a bunch of Germans. And they just watch and captured Americans, their mannerisms and their speech. They could speak English, the Germans could. They all had our uniforms on. They come up through the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we didn't know who they were. In fact, we were showing them two bait jeep loads through the minefields so, so they wouldn't get blown up. <laughs> I don't know how Lieutenant Johnson knew so quick, but he... He said, hey, stop them. He said, had a guy with a machine gun up on the bank. Stop them. He said, they're Germans. Well, you know, you just think, you just don't start shooting Americans just because the time it got through their head that they were, they, we got the back jeep load and the other one, they called 2nd Battalion and told them they was coming and what they looked like. They called back a little later. They had them. And I know, uh, uh, what, oh yeah, up there in the Battle of Bulge. We was fighting, and it's getting dark. It's, it got dark on us. We was along the edge of the road, Germans with half tracks and things out there. And <clears throat> But just before dark, we look and we see a bunch of SS troopers going into this little town. We look, over here come the 504 Parachute Regiment coming into town. We try to get a hold of them to tell them, you know, that, and, uh, I guess they must have got a hold of them or something. Anyway, next day, 504 walking out, marching out the other side of town. <laughs> the Germans had their hands on their head and guys are taking them back. That's pretty good. The MSS trooper, they didn't give up career easy. They, just, they, they couldn't believe they lost the war, really. Mm -hmm. Because after the war, we were going up on a train and they had a train load of them SS troopers. We stop right side of them while you want uh, about like here at the window. And oh, Guy Campbell, he was a comedian anyway. And he, he was looking at German major, and they just sitting right there. They wouldn't even look at us. You know. And the old guy said, Hey, you guys know why you lost the war? He said, Hotsy totsy, I'm a Nazi, but you you made a mistake because we're we were super duper paratroopers. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yeah, at that at that time, it really seemed funny. I guess because everything was so tense. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, uh, well, you mentioned that you've got. Um a couple injuries, one on your back, and what else happened to you? What? You were injured a couple other times? Yeah, I got injured in Holland, working on a there? German. <clears throat> we was up there in this hedgerow, and <laughs> we were pretty light. We were stretched out, you know. So they told the guy, anybody comes up through there, capture them or shoot them. Don't let them get back. They find, find out how we're stretched out like this. They go through us, them tanks just like nothing. Well, they came up there, and the guys got the fire. And anyway, next morning, guys laying around, and uh, I'm taking care of my guys. And I was looking. I I could see this German laying out there moaning. <clears throat> Johnny Johnson come up through there, first lieutenant, nice guy. He said, Pinky, you check that guy out. I said, no, I was thinking about it. 
I don't know if Johnny knew or not, but I knew I was going to be exposed if I crawled out there. He come back about 20 minutes. You checked him yet? And I said, no, I'm still thinking. <laughs> so finally I crawled out there. He'd been shot across the stomach and tough times were pulling out, but they weren't ruptured. So I pushed him back in, got sulfa powder on him, put a big piece of tape right around him. Around him. Had a hard time because he's quite heavy. He was a parachuter, German paratrooper. Lieutenant. And, oh, good, good, good. He's seen them red cross. I was working on him. And uh, all of a sudden, they started shooting at me. So I jumped over top of him and tried to get back that little ditch. And then there's a bank right there. But we were in that ditch, see. And finally, I got back to the ditch. And <laughs> Jungle Jim says, you hurt? And I said, he said, careful, they're coming close. That's what he said, something like that. And I said, I know, I, they, I'm hit already. But I said, <clears throat> I'll make her. And, but see, what was happening was they were shooting HE, high explosive bullets. And that bank was all stone. They hit there and it spattered. Now my old hips was going back and forth. And I thought, gee, I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting hit pretty hard, you know. And I was crawling fast as I could, and then they knocked my arm out from under me. And that, that's when I got hit there. And, <clears throat> and I, I finally got through the opening, and I run through there, and Cy Henning, our first sergeant, come run. Pinky, what's the matter? And I, <laughs> I got hit. And he said, where? And I said, get back, here's the worst. And he began to laugh, and I looked, what's the matter? That's your canteen, that's water. <laughs> I said, they put a hole through it. And, they were shooting at me with them, with their nine millimeter machine gun. Then they opened up with a, like our 20 millimeter. Then all of a sudden they opened up that big old Bofer 40 millimeter. Gee, I, and one of them had a, tracers in it. Now I could see those suckers coming in. <laughs> it looked like they were gonna hit you, you know. When I got through there and I got to him, I said, oh my, I'm hit here. I could feel the blood running down. He, he called the aid station, told them that I was wounded. So they sent a jeep right out. And it, uh, it swelled up twice as big as it was and it turned blue. They, <clears throat> they uh, sent me back, but then I came back because we couldn't get out of there. 101st didn't have that road open all the way, all the time. And uh, <clears throat> so, then I went back to the aid station, and I could work around there. And uh, and I let's see, I worked. There. I, in fact, it's still in there. In you still fact, have what? Yeah, shrapnel in there. Yeah, they weren't supposed to be shooting at you. They could tell you were a medic, right? I don't know if they could tell or not. My uh, Red Cross was on that side, but I don't think they'd. What about your helmet? <clears throat> didn't it have a? No, we didn't wear one of them on a helmet because we figured it was too good a target. <laughs> really? So there wasn't some sort of a, a rule where you don't shoot each other's medics? Oh, I had it on your arm. Red Cross. He had to have a Red Cross somewhere. But we was over there one time. I think it was Morgan. We went around a bend with a Jeep. I wasn't with him. There's a German tank. The top was open, the soldiers up there. He looked at me motion. They went back. They didn't shoot him. They didn't all shoot him, but uh, it's, it depends a lot on the guys, you know. What about the um, the German soldier you were working on, the paratrooper? You know what happened to him? Well, he lived. Oh, he, uh, well, it's, Did you <laughs> drag him back, or you left him out there? I left him out there, but our BAR man shot him. General After Jim. you fixed him? Yeah, he shot him because he hit me. Because he shot me, you know, I got shot, you know. But then he still lived, and so they got him back and got him out of there. Oh boy, so he had a rough day. Yeah. <laughs> and then you had one other injury? That was my own fault. 
But that's why I told the doctor. That said, wasn't shooting a chicken, was it? <laughs> no. <laughs> we saw, Sergeant Zeitner and I, we saw this house down in that valley. We see Germans going in and out of it. Where was this? Huh? Where was this? Oh, it was up in, I don't know if it's Belgium or not, but it was in the bulge. And we hadn't seen anybody there for a day or so. So Sergeant Zeitner and I was going to go down see if we could find some food. We never had enough to eat. And so I was going to go in the back and he's going to come in the front, but I didn't have a gun, stupid me. I thought I, I'll just wait and let him. He had a Tommy gun. I waited and I waited and I waited and I didn't hear any. I thought, well, maybe he's in there. So there's a shed. I stepped in the shed and there's a door and I turned the knob real slow. Open it. There's a, five Germans. <laughs> One had a pistol. Boy, I wheeled out of there and he shot. He didn't really, he just made a red welt across my hip. And I didn't know that. I had that until I felt air, cold air getting <laughs> to me. And I said, <clears throat> and then Sergeant Zeitner shot him all right through the window. Killed all five of them. <clears throat> so we run back in there. We got some cheese and some bread. <laughs> Dark bread they have, and uh, pumpernickel. <clears throat> yeah, we got out of there, but let's see. I, I was wounded, so you could get a uh, oak leaf cluster. But I'll tell you why. <clears throat> I didn't turn that in, <clears throat> but they wrote me up for the Silver Star in Normandy. Well, I asked Captain Stenhouse, I said, what do you think about these medals? He said, well, Pinky, I don't think we come over here to win medals. He said, we came over here to do a darn dirty job and stay alive and win. And I told him, uh, I, I thought so. So I went and told uh, Alan Langdon. I said, I'd rather not get one because I said it's, said, it's so hard to tell what's above and beyond the line of duty for a medic, and I said, I'd, I'd rather not. Okay. But the guys in the medics, or in the company, they knew that. And they'd tell them, <clears throat> they'd tell them, rookies, how's our medic? They, oh, we got the best one there is. Mm -hmm. They'd tell them, <laughs> we got the best one in the regiment. We wouldn't trade him for anybody. But, uh, You're a popular guy. Did you get extras because of that? Huh? Did you get extras? They give you like uh, extra rations. Did they? Uh, no, how'd they no, take care of you? We got the same as they did. <laughs> no, I'm saying, I'm saying your your comrades, your friends. They take care of you. <clears throat> well, as good as they could. They, uh, but um, it was more the other way around. I was, I was a farm boy. I was used to dressing out really, really hogs and chickens. And turkeys, that's what we had on the farm. We had to, and I was in charge of that, so I could dress out something, and I'd go alone, and then I could get away with it. They wouldn't see us. Um, besides the Purple Heart and the Oak Leaf clusters, did you get any other medals? I turned on that Medal of Honor, but let's see. I mean the Silver Star. I got the, no, just the French Legion of Honor I got later. And and we got the French Fotogere, the Belgian Fotogere, and the Dutch Lanyard. But they were for the whole group. Mm -hmm. And uh, Yeah, we had quite a <laughs> quite a time, but there's um we lost. I think they said we had when we jumped in Holland. General Gavin, he came up because he trained us. He trained the first battalion. We were his battalion. And then he made uh, he got promoted when he took over the division or the regiment. And then he when we jumped in Holland. He got promoted to uh, uh, 
a major general, two-star general. He's the youngest two-star ground general in the war at that time. And he was 37 years old. And he came out and told us, he said, right now, the 505 is the largest it's ever been. There's 1,999 men in it. I'm coming out and jump with you. I'll make 2,000. I ain't going to jump first, and I expect every man to follow me. Somebody said, you be in a hell of a fix if we don't. <laughs> he could lie. <laughs> Everybody liked him. I know he's out telling us that, and Major McAvoy is back there with Father Conley. He said, I hope he don't ask him to jump without parachutes. I know everyone would follow him. Hmm. <laughs> he was a nice person. Well, you've, you've described some combat events. Um, and being a medic, you've seen a lot of the, the effects of war. You heard of the phrase that war is hell. Mm -hmm. You agree with that? That's right. How so? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you. First of all, war takes away your young people. They put them in uniform stuff, you know. And they're the ones you're planning on to run your country and be a little bit smarter than you were, each group, you know. And, and they can't go to college, they can't do this, they can't do that. And, they're, and most of the time they're just working for defense, you know. And then you send a lot of them in combat and some of them never come back. So you've lost them. And they were probably some of your smartest young people. And they, uh, <laughs> I gave a talk on that over there this mm -hmm. last year. <laughs> I forget now. So what anyway, I'm trying to, what I I'm... wound up, I told him, I said, then I got some good advice for you. My dad gave it to me. He said, this is a pretty good life if you want to make it that way. It's up to you. And then I said, uh, here's, oh, the roads were packed. and everything. Was you over there? Mm -hmm. This year, this last year, yeah. Yes. And I said, and here's some advice for everybody out there. Dad gave me, and that was, keep a sense of humor. <laughs> you find it makes life easier. During, uh, well, what did you witness or experience that made war hell for you? Oh gee, them guys getting wounded so bad, and I know up there, and, and, and I asked uh, Chaplain Woods, I said, what do you do when you get out there and them bullets, gee, you know they're just missing you about six inches or so, and them shells are busted? And he said, well, I tell you, I get all prayed up before I go in, and I tell the Lord, now I'm going into action, and I want to I'll be doing my job, and i placing myself in your hands to look after me. So I tried that. And that helped a lot until I started hitting too close. But you know, it did. Helped a lot. And I did all right. Only time, one time I started crying up there. It was in the, well, just about the end of war. It was wet and raining and cold dark, you know, and uh, you know, I told the Lord, if I ain't going to make it, take me now. I said, I had about all I can take. How long was that since you started that moment? That was one year? Oh, I'd been in, yeah, this is almost the end of war. This was in 45. We went up for the, I don't know, the Battle of Rhineland or something. And Pretty quick. Had about ten minutes. I figured he wasn't going to take me. I better get out of here. <laughs> what was happening that made you have that moment? Oh, I cold and wet. And the guy's getting wounded. You couldn't use a light. You had to work in the dark and muddy. You know, and trying to keep it. Was there? There was a co combat was going on at that yeah. moment. Artillery raiding cane with us. But um, then I just. Uh, started crawling out and out around from somebody, a medic, 
And then I heard Sergeant Deitner on Pinky, you all right? <laughs> I said, I am now. <laughs> and I, I went on and took care of him. He watched out for me pretty good because he knew I didn't have a gun. Well, all the guys did, you know. During combat, does time slow down? Does time slow down? Yeah. When, when the bullets are whizzing by, I mean, kind of tell me how that is. What's going on when that's happening? You're crawling around and... Yes, you are. And if a guy's wounded... Or things super fast. Yeah. Wh which way is it? Well, you ain't thinking about time. You're thinking about... I don't know. But I know after the war, or after it's over, I always was hungry as I could be. <laughs> Made me hungry. I guess the whole adrenaline and everything are pumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you have any rituals or habits before you knew you were going to go into action? Oh, I'd go to... I made sure I went to church. So every time you knew there was a big battle, you go to church the day I'm before? Back, most guys did, you know. Up there in the Battle of Bulls, we pulled back to the town of Thieu, Belgium. We then, there's six of us, we stayed in a big creamery, or he'd take farms and bring the milk in, farmers, you know, send their milk in there. And it, oh, the snow was snowing, it was deep and cold. And Gordon Engel, he's another good buddy of mine, he'd got through the, I think Minnesota State, he went through college. He's a little older than I was. And uh, he looked out the window and he says, gee. He said, you going to church, Pinky? And I said, you know what? I wasn't going to, but you know, everything we've come through and we're still here. I, I said, you know he's looking out after us, so we better go. So he and I went and we were only two there. And they have so we had communion with the chaplain. Yeah, I remember that. What would, prior to combat, what would some of the soldiers do or talk about? Anything? Prior to combat? Mm -hmm. Well. They tell stories about home or did you no, do I things you, to get your people, mind off? I'll tell you, when those guys were hit bad, usually it's their mother. Yeah. Usually they all think of their mother. And oh. yeah, you got to have a lot of faith, I tell you. It's, it's tough being a, a medic, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. you're right there seeing yeah. it firsthand what's happening. And some of them are your good buddies, you know, and you know, almost like a brother. You always wonder, why did he get killed? But you always thank the Lord that you were still alive. Did you ever, as the war dragged on, did you feel more fatigued? Did you get tired? Long towards the end there, when I broke down, I tell you, I said, they're just going to keep sending us in. We're going to keep going in. We're going to get killed. And it felt like a meat grinder? Yeah, because we had some good men, and all, all of a sudden, geez, they get five or six old timers who get killed all at once. Mm. And you, you think of all the combat and all the shells and things been fired at you, and you think, hey, every once in a while you look, we ain't gonna make it. Did you? But then we get feeling better. Like Johnny Johnson, he said, you know, Binky, we always said that you could go into a barracks bar full of men before they jump and they're all quiet, not saying a thing. Five minutes later, you got them all laughing. <laughs> He said, "You were the comedian." <laughs> I guess so. But <laughs> he said, that, "That's your ability. Hmm. Do something like that." What about the the I, new I, the newcomers? 
Well, the they, replacements, did you? Know, you... They, one of them, I'll tell you, I got hit in the arm up in Holland. I've been back to the aid station about two weeks, and all of a sudden, C Company, we were under Montgomery, and he was tidying up the lines, cleaning them up and tidying them up the battlefield. There. And he was losing men, too, doing that. And so the Jeep was going up to pick up the wounded, so I went with them. I had my arm out of a sling then. <clears throat> and uh, I, I got out of the Jeep and started to cross the field there, like the guys were moving up, and this one guy's a hollering and screaming. The guy hollering, his buddy, he said, you want me to stay with you? You want me to stay with you? And I run in, slid in there on my knees like I usually did. I'm all right, Pinky's here, shut right up. He said, I'm okay. <laughs> ah. So I took care of him, got him blowed down the Jeep. Then I went back to Jeep, Chester Harrington, he was a medic. He'd about had it, you know. And he was looking all around and everything. I said, Chet, give me your aid kits. I'm gonna stay with C Company, tell Captain Stenhouse I'm staying out here. And what do you uh, mean by about had it? He was not functioning anymore? They're pretty close to going. I'll tell you, you take them old timers and when they go, be section eight, you know, they never come back, they're mine. Well, you, as a medic, when he, when he started seeing old timers that were dying, he started to really get affected by that. Yeah, I thought, Jesus, we can lose this war yet, you know? Because we, we, uh, and they were nice guys too, most of them, yeah. Did you have, um, would you consider that you suffered any kind of trauma during the war? I mean, you mentioned, I guess, the moment where you had a little bit of a breakdown. Oh. Well, yeah, took quite a while to get over it after you got home. And uh, what was it? What? Oh, well, we had a big fair in our town, Ionia. Had a biggest uh, outdoor entertainment fair the, in Michigan, over a mile and a half long, midway. I walked down there and all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom! Holy mackerel! They shoot them guns just to make a bang. I got right out of there. I couldn't take that. Because how how long after the war was that? Oh, probably forty six. So within a within a year, you were no, still. Bother. It took oh it took quite a while to get, get over that. <coughs> I had another buddy of mine. He got all shot up. He wasn't in me in my outfit, but he's in my hometown. And. Uh, we go up to the lake, there's a lake, Snow Slate, and we go up there and, and uh, go fishing. And just everything was so quiet and peaceful. That was just our way of letting the war go. Because uh, you can't go through all that and not be affected by it. And some a lot worse than others. How did it affect you? Well, for one thing, a lot of times you're just going on your nerves, you know, and you can only do that so long. And then, then I'd, I'd try to get away from it or do something else. Or, well, you couldn't do something else because in combat, but when I got out of it, uh, they'd send us on furlough and stuff right out. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me the, what was the nerves? Were you jittery? Uh, describe kind of what was what was going on for you? Well, yeah, because you know, you saw so much blood and carnage, and you were taking care of them fast as you could. And I wasn't used to that. I mean, you no, know, nobody's used to that, you know. And geez, you know, and well, now if you see somebody killed on the highway, you're not expecting it, you know, it affects you. Huh? But if you're something like that, one day after day, why? Did it make you have problems sleeping? Yep. I had a big towel beside my bed, and I put a sheet, or a kind of rubberized sheet under my sheet. Holy mackerel. I'd wake up and I'd be, be shaking for all I was worth. Sweat all over me. I'd have to take, get up and wipe myself off. 
change the sheet, get back in bed again. This you is know, when? When I come home. In, uh, well, in combat or you're talking about stateside? No, I was talking about safe, stateside. Stateside? It, it, took, you know, it took a while to get over that. How long did those, did those, that sleeplessness last for you? Well, I went to the doctor. I couldn't eat either. I'd eat about two spoons full. I couldn't eat. You're talking about back in the States? Yeah. And then he gave me a tincture of belladonna and stuff from my stomach and things. And then it just took time. Gradually I got a little bit better, a little bit better. How long do you think that took? I'd say it took probably till I got married. Remember, we used to go to movie and they'd start shooting and how long when did you get married well i got out of the army in november 45 and we got married uh january 47 mm -hmm. but it was uh but a lot of guys had it a lot worse because some of them they just well they went combat fatigue they call it mm -hmm. First World War, they called it shell shock. Did you have to treat people like that in the field? Did you see that? Somebody just paralyzed and couldn't move? No. But I seen guys that we had to get out of there in a hurry, you know. And what, what <clears throat> they had just had a, a glassy look in their eyes and didn't move? They just get to shaking and stuff. <clears throat> that ever happened to you? Not over there. <laughs> it happened here. It's stateside. Yeah, after I got home, I, I'd go to bed, and uh, all of a sudden I'd wake up, and I was just a shaking and a sweating. And the Germans was coming over the hill, and we weren't dug in. Oh, God. That was like the nightmare you would have? Yeah. We were never ready, and we just... So that was like a continuous nightmare that yeah. you would have. Mm -hmm. Germans coming over the hill, and you weren't ready. That's right. We're fighting, and here come the enemy. What about feelings of guilt? Did you ever have that? No. Only I felt bad because <clears throat> I could have saved some guys. I didn't say because I didn't have, <clears throat> well, I had my own mind that a plastic hose to get shot in here. I lost uh, Gennetti, Italian boy there, and right by the bridge in there. And if I if I just had a hose or something, I could have got down that artery and, up, and that one then tied it. I could keep them alive to got them back to the aid station back there. But but you can't dwell on that because there's too much happening anyway. You know, just hurry in, hurry in. I know that Nordyke, he wanted to meet a medic, well, like I was, I was out with the company. And I was walking up there and Morgan looked around. <laughs> he says, here's one of the best you could interview, he says. He said he should have the Medal of Honor. He says, ain't that right, Pinky? I said, Fred, we all should have had the Medal of Honor. And Fred, he uh, got promoted from Staff Sergeant to the Lieutenant, and uh, that's how I finally wound up being a Staff Sergeant. But anyway, then he come home and he didn't feel good. He was sick, and I don't know things bothered him and, and for about a year. And then he went back in the Army and uh, retired as Lieutenant Colonel. He was a nice guy, Fred. He is a nice guy. He's still alive. Mm -hmm. Lives on Martha's Vineyard. He, we get talking about every four weeks. But like I said, he and Lieutenant Johnson, Gus Sanders, first lieutenant, Captain Stenhouse. I said, whoever coined the phrase an officer and a gentleman must have had them in mind. Hmm. Because I said, that's just what they were. And the nice thing about it, they didn't know it. But that, uh, that's just their way. A lieutenant, 
uh, Sanders, Gus Sanders. I talked about up there in the Battle of Bulge. That day we attacked and we lost so many. Well, he got hit, broke a leg, I think, and two, he's hit bad. And I was working on him. And I didn't see him for about 40 years. We had a reunion in Houston, Texas. And God, he see me, he runs out his arm around me, he started crying. He said, Helen, come here. That's Billy. And he said, I, she said, come here. I, Here's Pinky, the guy that saved my life in the Battle of Bulls. She said, I was wounded bad and they was shelling us. And he said, he throwed himself over top of me to protect me, save my life. Oh dear, she says, is that right? I said, not really. I said, I was trying to get underneath him because he was already wounded and I wasn't. And he laughed, Pinky, you will never change. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So you mentioned about those uh, loud noises that disturbed you at the fair. How long did that kind of, oh, how probably long did that last? Four or five years. Really? That yeah, long? Because it's, well, if something happened and you, you see you're just walking along, you're not, all of a sudden it yeah, makes you think you're back there again, I think, you know. And mm -hmm. I know the, the war ended when, when we spearheaded across the Elbe River. And we, uh, they told us we didn't get there at about five o'clock. We went up from between Bonn and Cologne and trucks. We got up there about five o'clock, relieved the Germans or the English. And there's a big dredge run down in the river. So at midnight, they said we were going across the river. When you hit land, run in quite a ways because we got more coming, more guys. Okay, so we got there, and then the, the Ger English didn't tell us anything about the, where the G Germans were or if they get in shell. The guys lined up for shell, and geez, they shelled, killed two guys. And then we went across that river, and we run on the we hit land, we run and run right across it, <laughs> right in the river again, hmm. island. And it was snowing like mad, a late April storm. I think it was 28th of April. And so uh, then we run back and we had to get the bo get the uh, boats back, you know. I just knew they was gonna send up them flares and be just like daylight, but they didn't. And we got the other side, run in, we captured the Hamburg police force. They was protecting the, the beds in the big belly and sleeping, they wasn't monkeying around in the storm. So we got them. And then the engineers, was trying to get their bridge put across, the pontoon bridge so they get tanks across. And the artillery was raiding the heck with them. And so we was pushing in trying to get to the artillery. Oh, we finally got there. Things quieted down. And we then uh, John West, my little pharmacist, they shooting at us and we went and drove under a wagon in a farmyard. <laughs> they put a bullet burn right across his back. <laughs> But, he, but that didn't break the skin. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we come out of there and then all of a sudden, things got quiet and there was a Jeep there down the road a little way, walked down there. We could hear him talking on that Jeep. Radio was on. And we couldn't understand them. We knew they weren't German or French or Belgium or We'd been around through all them countries, and not that we were so good at it, but we knew what was what by then, you know. They did give us books and things. So. And pretty quick, here come Ivan Woods. He was with a uh, service company. And I said, hey, Ivan, what is this? Russian. Hmm. He said, they were Russian tank drivers. Some of them were women. <laughs> and he says, I said, well, how far does this radio carry? Not over 12 miles. No, 15 miles, I think he said. Not over 15 miles. I said, Jesus, we're about over. Yeah. And then, and then everybody was starting to make sure they didn't get hit. We're getting <laughs> taken mm -hmm. care of ourselves. And, and anyway, the Germans, all, all of a sudden, here they come our way. They just surrendered. 
thousands to of getting them. away from the Russians. Mm -hmm. In fact, there were so many of them that uh, some of the officers, line officers, asked Stephanie or Stenhouse if any of the medics wanted to kind of fill in between the lines. The guys are so far apart, you know. He said, "Well, I can't tell them to, but if they want to volunteer." So I said, I'll go. So I went out there, and here they come down through the mud, you know. And here come a German major He's riding one of them things up like this, going backwards, you know, motorcycle guy driving it up front. I stopped him. He got by the first guy and the second guy, and I made him get off. Oh, he was mad. He didn't want to get off, so I cocked the old high uh, carbine. I wasn't going to shoot him, but I was going to hit him side the head with a stock. And he got off then. He see he'd better. And uh, then he started walking, and I booted him with my oh mud. He's all dressed up. He wanted to retire or er, surrender to Eisenhower, I think. <laughs> 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 oh, he was mad. Then I got on that. It didn't take me long to have that. I drove back, talking to all the guys. I got way back there. Here come a Red Cross truck. I told them what I was doing. So they gave me a whole bunch of donuts and coffee. And then I go by and give a guy a donut and a drink. Up the next one. I get way out there, that first one. I stayed out there and talked to him for quite a while. Yeah, kind of made him think, hey, there is a link between us, you mm -hmm. know. And they... Yeah, they thought that was okay. But I know once in the Battle of Bulls, we had them weasels. They had tracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had one. They got, I don't know where they got it, but we got one. And uh, they wanted me to go out to C Company. I had mail, so okay. So I took the mail, and then I got a bunch of donuts, some more Red Cross, and and some coffee and a rig round hat with a cover on it. And I straddled a stump, throw the track. I got out, I was alone. I thought I saw something moving over in there, I was watching. Yeah, I see some Germans. So I began fading back. Yeah, I finally they cut loose shooting at the weasel. I told the captain, so next morning, uh, one of the guys that was a mechanic, <coughs> motor pool. He went with me and we got the track back on and got her running. <laughs> coffee all run out of my, they put holes through my, mm. I want to hold the coffee and they're going to get run out and froze. But the donuts were all right so I went back <laughs> and got another, I went back and got another a coffee or fixed up and then I went out and then I give the guys their mail and donuts and coffee and no wonder they liked me. <laughs> <laughs> When you were um, fixing up everybody with all the in the combat and all the bullets are flying by, did it get a point towards the end of the war where you just got used to it? I suppose kind of, kind of, but you always had to keep watching. It's a good thing I was a farm boy because I could figure out the lay of the ground real quick and stay to the low spots, you know. I mean, did it, did did all the you said carnage? Did you did, it, did you become numb to that after a certain point? I did because I just turned my mind off and I just worked on the stop the bleeding, check the breathing, and I couldn't treat. You became for it. you became mechanical. Yeah, well, I you was doing the best thinking. I could. I knew what my job was, and that's the only thing that saved me. I was just too busy doing my job. Were there ever times where you thought? better them than you? Did that ever? Who, the guys that died? Yeah. My guys? Well, you know, self-preservation does run really strong. Mm -hmm. I mean, you like life. You see them, and you feel so bad, and then you thank the Lord that it wasn't you, you know, that he... Yeah. Did your experience from the war impact you 
to this day? Do you have anything going on to this day that still troubles you? I mean, loud noises, oh, you nightmares? Mean no. Yeah. No. Nothing. It's all gone. Yep. Was I'm there? Gone. Was there? That's good. Was there a point where you didn't want to talk about the war? I never talked about it much until Tom Brokaw came out with that Greatest Generation. Okay. That book. And then, then it became popular and people want to know. But see, I was like Sergeant Zeitner. I said to them, well, I was out there working in the field one day. We'd got a phone call that night before and he wasn't feeling good. He lived in Eugene, Oregon. We were in Michigan. And I was out there working. I said, by golly, you know, and Zeke and I went through a lot. He saved my life a few times. I saved his. And I think I went up to the house for lunch and I said, Junie, how would you like to go out to Oregon? She said, why, you want to see Zeke? I said, I'd like to. She said, okay, let's go. So I called Zeke and told him I was coming out to see him. So we flew out to Portland, and from Portland to Eugene, and, and we stayed out there. He rented a motel for us somewhere, and, and when I met him at the airport, he gave me his car keys, and I drove, because he was older than I was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and he showed us around, took us out to Crater Lake, and all over out there, and, and uh, yeah, and he had a, had a friend. He called him his, his son. His son was older than Zeke. He was 95. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you tell me, he said, <clears throat> We went down to uh, California. They'd won a prize. Two men could go out deep sea fishing, and that was a prize. He went down there and took his son. Well, he said he caught. He said he caught a big fish. He said he was a boy. He said and he's pretty old. And I thought I said, hey, you want me to relieve you? Uh, I hooked him. I'll land him. And, and the captain of the boat even came down and said, you want me to relieve? No. And uh, Zeke said, he never drank only once in a great while. He said, he finally landed it, weighed 143 pounds. And, and uh, he said, Zeke says, he said to me, give me a beer. <laughs> 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 yeah, he give me a beer. And uh, then about a half hour later, Zeke hooked one. His was half a pound lighter. <laughs> that tickled the old fellow. Then he had a birthday coming up that in a couple months when we were out there. So when we got home, they they went to, what was that restaurant? Uh, Denny's. Denny's. They had some nice Denny restaurants though in Oregon. One was halfway up the mountain. You look down, they went out there a lot. They knew him out there, him and his, his buddy. And, and uh, so, uh, I couldn't get any gift certificates out there at those places. Didn't have any. So I was in Lansing about a week later. Went in there and they had them. So I, we got them a gift certificate and sent it out there. Uh, and I sent a birthday card to Smitty, the old guy. How did they know it was my birthday? Hmm. Oh, they know what's going on, <laughs> he says. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, he said, that was fine. He said, I got that gift certificate and he said they're having a two for one this month so I get mine I take my <laughs> Smitty with me so <laughs> that worked out great mm -hmm. why did it take you so long to talk about the war what about the book made you want well, to talk Zeke told me he said you know what I started telling them about the war oh it couldn't have been that bad. You wouldn't be here that. So finally said, I just shut up. I wouldn't tell them nothing. They wouldn't believe me. So, you know, I said, I know. And I didn't like to talk about it anyway. Nobody asked me about it. And so nobody asked you. That's why you didn't talk about mm -hmm. it? Well, and that. I why didn't, didn't you want to talk about it? It wasn't a good experience. It wasn't a happy experience, as you might say. You know. Okay. It was something that. And you feel more comfortable talking yeah. about it now? Uh, huh? You feel more comfortable talking about oh, it now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, now. 
Now I'm in my twilight years. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to tell future generations about your experience? Like you have a comment, you could tell them something. <laughs> I gotta go to the bathroom anyway. I am some. Oh wait, you're you're still connected. Mm -hmm. You're still connected. Oh, where's this up here? Yep. And is there anything um, you would like to add um, or tell future generations about your experience from World War II? Well, from my experience and what I've read from other fellows, the one that wrote War as Hell was right. And peace is fragile and it doesn't come cheap. Uh, so once you get it, really guard it because it takes away your freedom and everything you do and your young people it takes and not only them but civilians and everyone and uh, so I say now life is good enjoy it I'd like to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today and thank you for everything you've done for our country mm -hmm. and all the people that you've saved and imagine all the other lives that resulted from that had they passed away children and grandchildren mm -hmm. wouldn't be around so thank I, you so much I hope you think about that as well I think about four years ago I had open heart surgery and then they kept me in self-induced coma for quite a while and uh, one of the guys up in New Hampshire, he sent out messages in Normandy and all over. Okay, all you guys that think he saved during the war, it's payback time. He says, he needs your prayers for, because I was up there and I, they kept me. Yeah. And then I got, when, then when I got out of it, I couldn't walk. I had to learn walk. And I still, still not too good in my sense of balance a lot of times. But I think that kind of gets you anyway, but, yeah, and uh, like I say, life is good. Enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>